as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The Bible here is teaching us that God will protect His Word. He's going to preserve His Word. He's going to keep it, it says. And, you know, we all know about eternal security, right? About the eternal gift, everlasting life. But we also need to understand about scriptural security, that it's eternal as well. God has promised us that He's going to protect His Word, the Bible, and make sure it's available to everyone forever. This is His promise. Look at the next verse, though. Verse number 8, it says, The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And look, today there are many different Bible translations out there. And many years ago I had a, a young man that got saved and he had read every religious text known to man except the Bible. And he was raised Mormon. And he said, well, I wasn't sure about reading the Bible because there's so many of them. I didn't know which one. But and he said, when I understood that it was the King James Bible, then I read it. Then it made sense. Well, there has to be one. They can't all be right because they are all very different. And today, you know, our church, we are King James only. We believe the King James Bible is God's word for today. And, you know, but yet there's a difference. You know, there, we are King James only, but we're not King James ugly. Yeah. And what do I mean by that? There's a group of King James only people called the Ruckmanites. They're not saved. They preach a, a false gospel, dispensationalism, a lot of heresy. Peter Ruckman was not saved. There's, there's the writings of Gail Ripplinger. And these are two straw men that the world will attack and say, oh, well, Ruckman or Ripplinger. Hey, we're, no, we're none of those, right? We are, we are Bible only. We don't believe in what they wrote. They wrote some very strange things. Um, and yet also people will refer, well, your Bible came from the Catholics. Well, that's not true either. The Council of Trent did not decide what scriptures are authoritative. God decided that. He wrote it. He distributed it. He has kept it and preserved it forever. And just because some Catholics got together and say, well, we agree. Since everybody's already re reading these or that, maybe we'll agree that this belongs there and this doesn't. And, you know, so, so I want to make that clear, first of all, that we're not Ruckmanite or Rippling or Catholic in any way. But, you know, this last verse, verse number eight here that we just read, the wicked walk on every side. When the vilest men are exalted, there has been an attack on God's word since the beginning. Since the devil said, yea, hath God said. And tomorrow is an anniversary of an event known as the 5th of November. In 1605, on November the 5th, there was an attempt to end King James's life and the Bible translators as they were compiling the Word of God, as they were putting it together. And they wanted to stop it, and this was a Jesuit conspiracy. The Jesuits are a secret society inside of the Catholic Church. It was founded by a man named Ignatius Loyola that wrote some very mystical, strange doctrines, I mean, very similar to Hinduism in a lot of ways. Um, pagan concepts, they go back to the Templars, Antichrist, sodomizers, very weird doctrines. And so they had a plan, they had hatched a plan that if they could blow up the parliament building, they could stop the translation that King James had authorized, what we today call the Holy Bible, the authorized Bible, the King James translation, they wanted to put it to an end. And so every year this event is remembered in England. They actually go around and they celebrate the fact that they put a stop to this conspiracy. They go around saying this phrase, remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I know of no reason that gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. And I would say today, I know of no reason we should forget it either. That Hey, praise the Lord, God intervened and stopped this conspiracy that, that tried to prevent God's word from spreading all around the world. Listen, the King James Bible is the most distributed, most printed, most read, most memorized. And look, I know if you, if you did on a yearly average today and you say, well, last year the NIV sold more. But hey, for years and years and years before the NIV was even hatched, the King James has been around more and more. And so tomorrow in England, they will celebrate this event. They will remember the conspirators, Guy Fawkes was his name and you know people say use the word guy like hey guy or that guy because of this guy now his name was guido and many of you have probably seen this image this is a picture of his face or a mask that they make of his face and this guido fox 
conspired with a Jesuit priest and about half a dozen other people to use 36 uh, barrels of gunpowder to stop the translation of the King James Bible, to kill King James himself and try to put the Jesuits back in control of a nation. And, you know, I thank God that it was stopped. I thank God that, you know, we can uh, freely read the Bible today. And this mask has since been used by a Satanist named Alan Moore that wrote a uh, graphic novel, if you will. And they, it was made into a movie called V for Vendetta. And, then, and it was a very anti-Christ movie, trying to slur religion and slur God and try to say that, you know, that anything religious is tyrannical. But look, God's law is perfect. The words of the Lord are pure words. God loves us. God wants us to have salvation. That's why he gave us the Bible. And this conspiracy, they tried to end it. And I, I thank God, you know, that, that that idol of Guy Fox. by the way, they make an effigy every year. They hang him up and they dance him around town and they end up destroying this effigy, this, this dummy. And there's actually also a hacker group known as Anonymous that has taken this face and put it as the forefront of their doctrine. Listen, there are some anti-Christ doctrines that come from this Jesuit conspirator, Guido Fox, and today they are still attacking the Bible. But, you know, thank God we have a Bible. Thank God that we have the King James Bible specifically, and I'm going to show you why the King James Bible is right, why it's accurate, how God has preserved it through time, and what's wrong with a lot of the other ones. Look, you're there in Psalm chapter 12. Find verse number 3. Verse number 3, the, the Bible reads, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. You know, that guy, Fox, he had to die. His, the curse of God was upon that man for trying to stop something that God was doing. And, you know, ultimately this guy was brought out in public. He was hanged, not quite to death, just enough to torture him, right? Then he was stretched out and quartered. His limbs were broken free from his body. He was cut into pieces, and they, they disemboweled him and set him on fire. I mean, a, a very strange torture, and I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but God allowed that to happen to this man because I believe of the perverse intention that he had in the Jesuit conspiracy to stop the Bible from being translated. Look, language has changed over time, and every now and then we do need an update today. The English language has taken a long time to get where it is today. And, you know, look at verse 4 there in this, in this chapter of these bad guys. He somebody said, Who have said with our tongue we will prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? And these conspirators said, Hey, we don't want some king. We would rather have a pope. Who is Lord over us? And they tried to kill King James. And, you know, they had, well, we're going to blow them back to Scotland. And we're going to set it free. And we're going to set up the Catholic Church. But God, in His sovereignty, if you will, in, in His power, protected the Word of God. Now, I've got five real quick points today. And it's of the Bible. It's the preservation, inspiration, perfection, translation, and salvation. We're going to start with the preservation. Look again at verse number 7 here. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That is God's promise. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And look, the Catholic Church has attacked the Bible for many years, and then you have a spinoff of Protestants and especially in Calvinism, where they try, to, they try to pervert the gospel. And we are not Calvinist in any way. We are King James only. We are faith alone for salvation as a church. And, you know, I think every year it's fitting to remind you why we believe these things. What the Bible says about it and how God has prevailed throughout history. You know, in Revelation 22, in the very end of the Bible, there's a warning. He says, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. God is saying these translators that made new Bibles, there is no hope of salvation for them. They have intentionally conspired to change God's word, and there is no salvation. Gail Ripplinger, who wrote a book about New Age Bible versions, some of you may be familiar with it. If you're not, don't worry. Don't search her out. Don't worry about reading her. She sounds like a Ruckmanite. She has a lot of bad doctrine. She claims to be the hand of God. She signs her books as G.A. Ripplinger, and she says, that's because I'm God's author. God authored the book. I should put his name on it, she said. I'm just his secretary. These are his words. She claims that her books are inspired. A lot of strange things that came out of her. And it's weird because she's a King James onlyist, but she has a very straw man 
uh, presentation that can be easily knocked down with history and textual. And so she actually said, well, there's, there's these other translators, and they were, they were not able to speak, and then they repented, and they got saved. Look, that's a lie. The Bible says that if you change the word of God, there's no salvation for you. You're done. There is a book of life. When you die, if your name is in the book of life, you will go to heaven. If your name is not in the book of life, you will go to hell. And God says, I will remove their name from the book of life. There's no opportunity. They're, they're reprobate. They're children of the devil that have conspired against God. Look here in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at verse number 2. Verse number 2, he says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Again, God's saying, don't add to the Bible. Don't take away from it. God has set his word in stone. It's finished in heaven. It's already been authored. And today, people constantly want to attack it. And look, the devil didn't have to write a new translation back in Genesis when he went to Eve. He just caused her to doubt it. Yea, hath God said? Did he really say that? Well, did he really mean that? And look, there is an attack today by people that want to cause you to doubt the Bible. And my goal for this sermon is to help you have confidence in the Bible and trust the words of God and know that you have it all and know that it's all for you. This is very important. Else, how can you have a guide in life? How could you open it and say, I know what I'm about to read is right. It's correct. It's been preserved by God. Go to, well, look at verse number three here. He says, your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that follow Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Baal Peor, God destroyed because he, hey, yea, hath God said. Did God really say this or did he not? And so God made sure that he judged them. And look, in Proverbs he says, Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. The false prophets that speak against God's word or try to change God's word to meet their doctrine, God will judge them. They can be found out to be a liar by opening the word that has been preserved. And listen, today we have a more sure word of prophecy. Amen. It's better than a vision. It's better than a thousand other Bibles. Hey, we have one thing that we can trust. We know it's right. God has promised He will preserve His word. Do you believe Him? Do you believe that God's big enough to protect His words? Do you believe that God's big enough to speak to us and make sure it's available to everybody? I mean, He created everything. He made me. He formed me. He does... But, I mean, a Bible? Yeah. Look, I mean, this takes a lot less effort on God's part in creation than it does to see a baby born in the womb. To see creation happen, and in six days, God create everything that is. Our first point was preservation. Our next point is inspiration. The inspiration of the Bible. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, where you're at, look at verse number 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What's he saying here? Every word of God is pure. All scripture of God is given by inspiration. Go, go to Proverbs chapter 30 if you would. Look, inspiration does not mean like artistic motivation. Well, I just stare at the stars and I get inspired to paint. Okay, that's not what this means, okay? Inspiration means it's breathed by God. God put His words in His men and what they said was the Word of God. It's as if God had spoke to you in God's stead. That's why He tells us that we have a ministry of reconciliation. We say, be ye reconciled to God. We go out in lieu of God because God's not going to miraculously split the clouds and knock on your door and say, hey, you need to be saved. Here's the free gift of salvation. He's going to send somebody. And that's our job. In 2 Peter 1, he says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It wasn't because some man desired to sit down and do it. He says, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God used people by stirring up his Holy Spirit inside of them so that they would preach it. And all throughout the Bible you see this phrase, the word of the Lord came unto so-and-so, came unto this prophet, and the word of the Lord came unto this guy. What happened? 
this prophet Samuel it happened to, Isaiah it happened to, Ezekiel, Zechariah, they're just going along their day, and then all of a sudden, God's Spirit falls upon them. They're baptized by the power and holiness of His Spirit, and they speak words that God wants them to speak. And listen, to, to be used of God, any of you that are saved have that ability. And it's not that you can write Scripture. Don't misconstrue what I'm saying. But you have the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you're walking in the Spirit instead of the flesh, if you're obeying God's commandments and you're being a righteous Christian, God will use you more and more. And He will use you to speak words to people that need to hear it. And that's how God used His prophets throughout the Bible. The Word of the Lord came unto a prophet. God breathed His words. Our first point was preservation. Our second was inspiration. The third point is perfection. I want you to understand that the Bible is true and you can trust every word. Now look, there are people often say, what's the, the biggest, oh, there's, there's contradictions in that Bible. Well, no, there's not. Look, when Mary said to Jesus, your father and I have been looking for you, Jesus corrected her and said, no, no, I've been about my father's business. Sometimes the author in the storyline gives us a dialogue so we understand what's happening. We understand, hey, just in case you forgot, Joseph isn't my father. God Almighty in heaven is my father is what Jesus was saying. Hey, the new translations, they destroy that verse. They muddy it up. They make it confusing. You're in Proverbs chapter 30. Look at verse number 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. He's a shield. He will defend you. Every word of God is pure. You can trust every word in your Bible. You know, we hand out these, these pamphlets, this, this tri-fold brochure. There's some in the back if you want one. You can go to our website, steadfastjacksonville.com slash Bible, and print out your own. All the information that's on here, very tiny, is, is in a larger print on the website if you would like to comb through it. But it goes through and it shows you the changes the doctrinal changes in the newer Bible versions, how they take out certain words. They want to attack the deity of Jesus Christ. They want to attack the fact that the Bible teaches a literal fire, fiery hell. There are 16 verses completely deleted. You can find that on the website as well or in this brochure. And these are very important doctrinal verses. This does not happen by accident. Because you think about it, if there's a hundred different translations, and then today what we call the King James that was known as the Holy Bible, the Authorized Bible, and this one has those 16, why do the 100 other versions delete these verses when they make very important distinctions about doctrine? One such is where the question was asked, what must I do to be, or, 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 to be baptized? There is water, what does hinder me from being baptized? Right? If somebody says, well, well I want to get baptized, what do I have to do? Well, if you ask a Catholic, they're going to say you have to be baptized as a baby. Now, if you go back in the history, the Catholics use that for political control. Well, we want to tax you every year and your family, so we baptize as soon as you're a baby. And we do it because just in case the baby dies, it'll go to heaven. So are you saying baptism saves? Well, a Catholic would say, well, no, no, entirely. you still have to do the works. You've got to, be, you got, to, you got to do our sacraments. You've got to confess your sins every week. So does it save or does it not save? One of the verses they all delete, every other Bible deletes, and that question is asked, what, must, what do I have to do to be baptized? It says, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the condition for being baptized. You say, hey, I want to be baptized here. Okay, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you do, then hey, let's do it. Let's get baptized. If not, then wait. We need to talk. We need to deal with your salvation first because baptism does not save. There are many such changes. This is freely available. If you want one, let me know. Like I said, you can look it up on the website. Where you're at in Proverbs 30, look at verse number 6. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. What's he saying here? And listen, this will, don't change God's Word. Well, I know He says I shouldn't get drunk, but I think it's acceptable we're in the New Testament. Careful. Don't meddle with God's Word now. And look, there are people that intentionally change God's Word because they have, they have a devil in their heart. They want to they change it and confuse people. God says they can't be saved. Go to Psalm chapter 119 right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm chapter 119. In 2 Samuel 22 it says, As for God... His way is perfect. 
The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. Hey, buckler, it's a shield. It will defend you. Knowing what the Bible says will help you as a Christian to be able to defend what the Holy Spirit reveals to you. You will understand it the more that you read. In 1 Thessalonians 2, he says, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Listen, if you don't believe that God has preserved a Bible, you're going to have a problem believing the salvation that comes out of it. You're going to have a real hard time understanding that and believing that. And he's saying, you received it as truth. When we preached unto you, you said, hey, that's the word of God. That's what God is saying. That's not just some man's opinion, which is why when we go out preaching the gospel, we open up the Bible, we show them what it says. I'm not here to tell you what I changed in my life. I'm here to tell you what God has done to save your soul. Those are two, two drastically different things. And look, you know, it's the word of truth, the Bible calls it. His word is truth. It's called the law of liberty. God has a law that will set you free. Amen. It will release you from the bondage of the punishment of your sin. It will deliver you from death and hell. Amen. Salvation is only found in the scriptures. Look, you're in Psalm 119. Go to the end of the chapter. Find verse number 160. Psalm 119, verse number 160. The Bible reads, Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endure forever. God's word has been established from the beginning, and it's right. He's preserved it. He has inspired it. It is perfect. It's true. You can trust it. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. You can trust the word of God. I want you to understand that. You can trust any King James Bible. And, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a Bible nerd. I collect Bibles, and I like to look at the history of the Bible. And I have, a, I have different variations of the King James Bible. And I will tell you, any King James Bible will do. That's the label that's used today because back in 1884, the Catholics released the revised version. So before that, it was just the authorized version. It was authorized by the king. So up until, from 1611 up until the eight, late 1800s, almost 1900s, you only had two Bibles. So they finished their New Testament in 1881, the complete Bible in 1884, and it was really hitting the printing presses in the beginning of the 1900s. So they had to identify the original Holy Bible as something different. They called it the Authorized Bible. Well, if you take a few steps back, there are different versions of the King James Bible. There's multiple versions of the 1611. There were misspellings. There were 1612. There were 1650. There's an 1863 uh, Scribner's. There's a 1769, there's a 1762. And I do not say this to confuse you. I say this to simplify it for you. There are minor differences like a capital letter here or there, a punctuation here or there. And people will often say, well, you can't trust the King James Bible. That's different than what you carry. Well, look, you know, the older English has changed over time. The King James Bible is written in modern English, is what it's called, right? And it, it actually, like the word shop, if you had a, like we're in a shopping center, right? They used to spell shop, S-H-O-P-P-E. Now we just say S-H-O-P. The word son used to be spelled S-O-N-N-E. That's how it's spelled in the 1611. The son of God has S-O-N-N-E. -N -E. Guess what? Now it's S-O-N. Same word, same doctrine, right? There were certain printer errors over time, but nothing that changed any doctrine. So you can rest assured if you say, well, I don't know if this is a, 1762 or a 1769, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It's God's word. It is preserved. It's not missing 19 whole verses. It doesn't have 65,000 changes in the verses. So hey, don't worry. You've got the main thing. You've got the right thing. Do not doubt any authorized version or any King James. Uh, you're in 2 Peter chapter 1. So my next point, it was the preservation, the inspiration, the perfection, and now we're going to talk about the translation, the translation. Look at verse number 19 in this chapter. 2 Peter 1, 19, we have, a more, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, 
as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What he's talking about here, they gave an account that we saw the heavens open. We saw the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We saw these miracles happen. And he says, but yet we have a more sure word of prophecy. The men that were there at the time, they say, wow, this was amazing. Let me tell you about this vision. But yet that vision was not as good and dependable as what we have right here. The scriptures, the oracles of God, the word of God, this can be trusted. This can be relied upon. This is where our doctrine comes from. Look, being a New Testament church, being independent, fundamental Baptist, what does that mean? Well, that means that this is the boss. This is the boss. If I started trying to tell you that, that John Calvin had a better way, you guys should run me out of here. If I started telling you, well, hey, I think we should honor the Pope, you guys should run me out of here. This is the boss, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God. This is what we get our doctrine from. This is what is in charge. And that should go with all doctrine in your life. Look at the next verse here, verse number 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now this is where people often criticize, well, how do you know you can trust that? A bunch of different men over a bunch of different time changed it. Well, look, what we have in the King James Bible can be verified by over 5,000 copies of the Bible that have existed for thousands of years. We can verify that what's in here is the same. We know that it's the same. And people want to criticize the Bible. That's why you have an alternative. They call it the critical text. They want to be critical of the thousands of copies and say, yeah, but we found one under a rock somewhere. We found one in a trash heap in the Pope's warehouse, and, we, and it changes doctrine. Therefore, we should go with what the Pope said. No, that's not how it works. You know, the Bible is clear that it is not of private interpretation, and this applies to Scripture also. It says that the spirit of the prophets is subject unto the prophets. What does that mean? If I get up and I prophesy, which simply means preach, and I start telling you, well, I think that all you women should cover your heads to be right with God. Then Brother Dale gets up and says, well, Brother Fannin, in, in uh, Corinthians 11, it says that the woman's hair is her covering. What I say is subject unto what God has already said. What I preach or prophesy is subject to the Word of God that is established and finished. So therefore, if somebody gets up and says something that is an error, it can be corrected through the Scriptures. This is what we trust in. This is what we depend on. We don't follow men blindly. Although the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. We all need leaders in life. We need men to look up to. We need preachers to listen to. And God used the holy men of old, right? They spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These men were given God's word through their spirit. The Holy Spirit filled them. They prophesied mightily. What they said are the very words of God. And listen, I had somebody yesterday, I had this, this crazy lady try to take my Bible out of my hand, and she was like, she was getting all weird, like, you can't trust this. And, no, I can't trust this, actually. I know that it's right. But I have uh, some, some charts also that we have. I've got some extras back here. I want to share this with you because our Bible comes from a dependable line of Bibles. And people will often criticize the Bibles and say, well, you think we didn't have the Bible until the 1600s? No. We've always had the Bible. If you look up certain verses in the 1300s, they're word for word identical to what we have in the 1611, to what you have in your hand in the 1769. The only differences would be spellings, punctuations, capitalization, right? Is there a comma here or there? So don't let people lie to you and try to take you off from the fact that God is big enough to preserve his word. In this, there are two essential lines. You have the Antioch line of the Bible that has over 5,000 manuscripts, over 5,200 copies of the Bible. And then over here you have the Alexandrian line of the Bibles, and there's less than 50. There are less than 50. And this is what you would call the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. It's also called the majority text, but there is a slight difference there. But the majority obviously is 5,000. 
versus over here, how many do we have? We've got like 50, right? Okay, would you trust 50 over 5,000? And their logic is wrong, their reasoning is wrong, but they call it critical text. They say, I will criticize what has been established, what the churches read and preach. We have something new and we'll criticize it with these new ones. And listen, new doesn't always mean better. There are copies of this available over there if you would like to take one with you today. I want to help you understand the, the, the King James Bible as we have it today has been refined. There are words that, that we use, you know, that we didn't use in the 1300s. Those were the changes from then. But from now, the new versions, they change so much stuff that it, it's just unbelievable. It's a different Bible. And, you know, the King James translator, there were 54 scholars. There were 56, a couple died, but there were 54 ultimately that spoke multitude of languages. And they understood a whole lot more than you or I probably ever will about languages, okay? And God's Word and, and how to put it together. Um, but my faith is not in those 54 men. I want to be clear here. My faith is in God. Can God use two men or 54 men? God can do whatever He wants. But if you look at the new translation, you also have, you usually have like half a dozen people or maybe a dozen at the most. Or some corporation said, how can we patent something new? We have to change 30% to call it our own invention. So what can we change and get away with it and still call it God's word? And look, our Bible is thorough. Our Bible is double checked. And a lot of times people will have a, a straw man argument and they try to blame it on Erasmus. Oh, well, Erasmus didn't have the end of the book of Revelation. He had to go to another source. Well, Erasmus was one man in one location, and the King James Bible is not specifically written by what Erasmus wrote. There's much more than Erasmus, and they try to ignore that. And there's a couple uh, of these effeminate God-haters in particular that attack the Bible. Yeah. James White and Todd Friel. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That does the wretched... Uh, radio, wretched YouTube videos. These guys are effeminate sissies that hate the Word of God. They want to attack and cause people to doubt. And if you could back them in a corner and say, well, which one is right? Well, none of them are right. I mean, any of them will do. Well, okay, I believe one is right. This is the right answer. It makes sense. This has all of the verses. This has all of the doctrine. This has all of the words. Every word of God is pure. What they are peddling is not. What they change the gospel. They're both Calvinists. They say that God chooses who gets saved, that it's not up to you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that God's going to pick you. And, and by saying that, they teach that God intended for the people that hurt children, that's what, that was God's plan, and for the people that will go to hell, hell, that God wanted them to go to hell. Look, that's weird. That's strange. God has given us all free will. God has given us the choice, just as he gave the angels. There are angels that rebelled against God, and there are angels that chose to serve just as with people. Hey, I have chosen to serve the Lord God. That doesn't make me a perfect person, right? But my soul is perfect. It is preserved unto the day of redemption because of his salvation. But these people attack certain characteristics of God. And, you know, all these other Bibles, ultimately, they attack the deity of God. They take the phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ, out of the Bible. Jesus was his name. Christ means Savior or Messiah. He's the one that died for my sins. He went to hell for my sins. He paid all of the punishment, and they want to take the word Christ out. He's Lord. He is God. They want to attack the Trinity, the Godhead, the deity of Jesus Christ. Every other Bible does this. Every single one of them. They want to attack baptism and what the Bible says about baptism. They attack hell. I mean, Sheol, Hades. Hey, if you say hell... People know what hell means. They understand hell. They attack churches and the church, if you will. They attack what God has said. They attack prophecy. They, have, they want to pervert the words of the living God. Look, my first points were preservation, inspiration, perfection, and translation. My last point is this, and it's the most important. It's salvation. It is salvation. You cannot be saved by the wrong Bible. And this is what our Bible teaches. Look, you're in 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse number 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God is saying there's two types of seeds. One is corruptible, one is incorruptible. If you go buy corn to plant, odds are it's going to be genetically modified, Monsanto patented corn 
that has a terminator gene that will not grow. That's all these new Bibles, right? If you had some of the maize that used to naturally grow all across America, and you just threw it in the ground, it would grow. It would grow naturally. And that is an incorruptible seed. God's Word is incorruptible. No matter how much they try, they can't change it. Well, we'll come out with a KJV 2000. We'll come out with a new King James. I'm sorry, it's corrupted. It's a different source. It's not the same thing. We know the King James is right. And listen, if another 100 or 200 years, the English language changes so much that there are certain words that need to be updated, that's different than what these other Bibles did. They didn't just make an update for our time. right? Some Bibles claim we have to have a new, a new translation for every generation. Well, look, the words that we speak are not that different. Every college reads Shakespeare, yeah, yeah. right? When was Shakespeare written? Put the college guy on the spot here. 1600s, yeah, 1606, 16, I mean, right, 1610. You got Shakespeare written at the same time. Everybody can look back and read that strange pagan doctrine that's in Shakespeare, right, written to attack God, and yet they can't seem to understand a King James Bible. The King James Bible was written at a lower level than most of these newer Bibles. Even the New King James has more archaic words than the King James Bible. It's understandable, and salvation comes from an incorruptible seed. If you have a, a, a pure organic seed that's heirloom, that's not like one of these genetically modified terminator seeds that will not reproduce. Only God's Word can reproduce. This very verse in the NLT, it says, For you have been born again, not to a life that will very quickly end. What? It says, mine says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God. You understand that there is an attack on the Bible and on verses to confuse people. I talk to people all the time, well, I don't know, I mean, I just don't understand it. I can understand why. Number one, because your Bible's wrong, but number two, these things are spiritually discerned. You have to believe, you have to believe that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. You have to have faith that God has a word, and that in it is his salvation. If you don't trust that, then what are you trusting your soul to? You think about it. This is very important. I want you to turn to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. In Psalm 126, the Bible reads, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. There is fruit of preaching the right Bible. It's called salvation. If you have a heart for the lost and you're spreading the word of God, you will doubtless come again rejoicing that people have gotten saved. They believed the Testament. They believed the gospel. They received Christ as their Savior. That's God's promise in his word. In Mark chapter 4, he gives us the, the parable of the seeds. And he says, the seed is the word of God. He said, the sower soweth the word. The sower, so what, what, is he, what are we doing? We're sowing the word. If you go door to door and you just tell people about your experience, that's not the gospel. That's not the word of God. Boy, I could tell you some stories about my life. That won't do you any good. Look, I don't want you to like me as a person. I want you to love God as a Savior. I want you to understand that He died for all of your sins. That you deserve hell. Every one of us, if we got what we deserved, it would be death and hell the second death. But thank God He has paid for all of that and offered us the free gift of salvation, everlasting life. And in Mark, when he uses that phrase, the sower soweth the word, he, warns, he tells us about some. He said, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. There are some we preach to that, hey, I preached to somebody yesterday, by today they may have forgotten it. There are people that are like that, they don't remember it. But he, then he tells us about the good. He says, some sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some and 100. Look, you want to be a soul winner? You want to reproduce? You want to have fruit that bears fruit as a soul winner? If you, are, I mean, if you go out one day a week, you can probably get 100 people saved in a year. Maybe you'll start with 30 or 60. But God is saying here, when you, when you receive that seed on good ground, you believe it, you get saved. Now you can study the word, give the gospel, and get other people saved and bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. Reproducing yourself. Listen, there is a necessity of having the right Bible for salvation. And this is a very controversial subject today because many people, number one, they want to tell you lifestyle evangelism. 
I just show them how nice I am and one day they'll come bowing down begging me how to be saved. Look, it doesn't work that way, okay? It doesn't work. All right. Other people will say, well, you can use any version, any incorruptible, any corruptible seed will work. And that's a flaw also. Yeah. Because if you're giving them bad doctrine from a bad Bible that has an intention to change heaven, hell, God, salvation, baptism, sanctification, resurrection, all of these doctrines are changed, guess what? You're, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. You're going to believe a lie. It is a corruptible seed. You're in Isaiah 55. I want you to look at verse number 11. This is very important. The Bible reads, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. What's the Bible saying here? That God, when he sends his word out, it will not return void. That when you use the Bible to preach to people, people can get saved. Amen. But if you don't use the word, it will return void. If you go out and give your opinion, it's going to come back empty. It will not do. It is insufficient. If you use the wrong Bible, you cannot get somebody saved. It's a different doctrine. They teach a different God. They teach a different eternity. Yea, they teach a different salvation. They want to tell you you have to turn from all of your sins. Well, you have to turn over a new leaf and completely quit saying, well, well, where is that in the Bible? How do I, where is that in yours? It's not in there. Repent of sins is not in your Bible, but guess what? It's in the other Bibles. Why? Because they want to preach a lordship salvation, a works-based salvation. I had a Pentecostal woman yesterday. I tried taking my Bible out of my hand. You don't need the Bible to get saved. She had all sorts of strange doctrine. The, the word won't return void. And she used this phrase to try to argue you can be saved without the Bible. In context, it says you have to have the word. It doesn't say if your opinion goes out, it won't come back. No, it says God's word. You can't get saved without the Bible. Listen, Calvinists will say, well, you're saved even before you hear the gospel because God picked you. You're one of his special ones. That's a lie. You have to hear it, you have to understand it, you have to believe it, and somebody's got to preach it to them. I had another person yesterday out preaching the gospel. Weird, weird, I mean, <laughs> this guy was out politicking for a, a candidate, and, well, yeah, I want to hear it, sure. I mean, I, he, I asked him, I said, are you sure if you, you died today? And he said, I wonder that all the time. I'm like, wow, okay. But I felt something was wrong with this person. I got a bad vibe right away from their spirit. Not that they were confrontational or emotional or out of, I mean, they just, it, it, it seemed real jittery. Something was off. I said, would you want to hear what the Bible says? Yeah, I got a few minutes. Yeah, go ahead. And I'm, I'm reading him through it. I take him to uh, Revelation 20, and then I take him to Revelation 21. He understands. Yeah, I understand. If you don't believe, you will go to hell. What do I deserve for my sin? I deserve hell. I understand that. I just have a problem believing that. Wait a minute. That sounds like somebody with a hardened heart. That sounds like somebody that God has given up on because they hate God. When I took him to Revelation 21, 8, the fearful, the unbelieving, where am I at here? The abominable, do you know what an abomination is? No. Okay, homosexuals, child molesters, perverts. It's like his eyes rolled like you would see a casino machine. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. It's, like, it's almost like I reached out and smacked the guy. Oh, 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 oh. So shortly after that, I just stopped and I said, do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, logically, I get it. If you don't believe that Jesus is God and he died for all your sins, then you will go to hell. Do you believe that? No, I'm just, I just can't believe that. You know, all right. I understand why you don't believe that, because you've already hardened your heart. There are people that have crossed a line with God. But look, we preached to everyone. I still gave that guy a chance. I wanted to have an opportunity. Look, now you're confronted with it. Now you know. He would say, logically, I understand what the Bible teaches. It's not about turning from your sin. It's not about changing your lifestyle. It's receiving the free gift. And if you don't believe I'm offering a gift, you can't get it. If I said, hey, I got $20. You say, I don't believe he's really going to give it to me. Then you're not going to come get it. And if you believe it, you'll come get it. It'll be yours. And that's what salvation is. Look, this is very important. Look at, I, I, want, to, I want to observe what's happening here in Isaiah 55 for a second because people throw this phrase around all the time that his word will not return void. And that means what God is saying is, this is the foundation of salvation. It is not saying, you can just say whatever you want, but, but you're a Christian, so it'll do. Or it's not saying, you're speaking on God's behalf, just give them your opinion and they'll understand it. 
There is power in quoting the verses. I quoted the verses to that young man, and it's like uh, something spiritually happened there. I quoted the verses to this crazy Pentecostal lady that wanted to tell me you didn't need the Bible, and I, I've spoken to thousands in Haiti, and she's got all these things. And, and it was a funny situation because at first she had the right words. I just believe it's Jesus. It's all by faith alone. Whatever he said, I believe. That's it. It's done. Okay, cool. Well, then why, why, why are we having a confrontation here? What's going on? Well, I pray every night before I go to bed. First thing I do when I wake up, I pray. What are you saying? Well, I mean, if you're really saved, then you're not going to... Is there anything you think you could do to lose your salvation? Well, I wouldn't. What about one saved, always saved? I don't believe one saved, always saved. So when Jesus said it's everlasting, you don't believe that. No, no, you can lose it. Okay, well, you're not saved. There's a problem there. If you don't trust in the everlasting life that God has offered you, you don't have everlasting life. It either lasts forever or it lasts never. I mean, you don't have it. Look, look at Isaiah 55. Look at verse number 1. This is really cool. He says... Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Hey, the free gift, the free gift of everlasting life. He uses that word, he uses that phrase in the Bible. But Jesus actually said, look, he's, he's talking about free, right? You don't have any money. But he says, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. Does that sound familiar? This is a salvation analogy. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if thou knewest the gift of God, right? And, he, and who it is you're talking to, he said you would ask and you would receive that living water. If you believe that and you understand that, you can ask for the living water and be saved. In Revelation 22, at the end of the Bible, it says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will. That means anybody that wants it, let him take of the water of life freely. If you want to be saved, you can have it, but it starts in the Word of God. Without the Word of God, you don't have the water of life. You're in Isaiah 55. Look at verse number 3. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of of David. How do we get saved? Hearing the Word of God, inclining your ear, believing in the everlasting covenant, the sure mercies of David. Salvation of the soul, not of the flesh. Not, it doesn't mean your flesh will be perfect. It means your soul is preserved. Look at verse number 6 in this chapter. Isaiah 55, verse number 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Hey, today is the day of salvation. When you're confronted with the gospel and you realize, hey, you know what? I believe something wrong. That's the time. That's the opportunity. Believe it right then. Yeah. Harden not your heart, as in the problem. Okay, no, oh, well, you know, I'll get around to it one day. Well, you see what you have to do. Yeah, I understand. I'm just not ready. What does that mean? They don't believe it. They don't want it. Maybe they don't understand it and you need to do something better to help them understand. But here he's saying, seek and call. Do you want to be saved? All you have to do is search for God and you will find him. That is God's promise. Look at verse 11. Verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. What's he saying? There's no salvation without that incorruptible seed. There's no salvation without hearing the word of God. The Apostle Paul, what happened? Hey, God revealed himself to the Apostle Paul. And he said, go in there and go talk to that guy. He's going to give you words what you must do. He's going to preach the gospel to you. He's going to help you understand out of the Bible how to be saved. That's the same pattern for today. There's salvation in no other way. Romans 10, how, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? We preach so they can hear, and when they believe it, they call on the Lord. That's exactly what Isaiah 55 is teaching here. So what does it mean when His Word will not return void? You go out preaching the Word. People will hear it. They will believe it. They will call on the Lord and they will be saved. That's God's promise. Amen. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Look, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Now He needs you to go tell people that. 
Go take part in your ministry of reconciliation. That is the Great Commission. This is a soul winning church and thank God we have a Bible we can stand on. We know that the words we're preaching to people are right, it's accurate, it's thorough, it's dependable. Hey, my five quick points were this. Preservation, inspiration, perfection, translation, and salvation. Those things we know for sure, and now we want people to know. Being born again of corruptible, of incorruptible seed. Now there's a problem with the other Bibles. And when we're done with this part, I'll just, I'll share this with you real quick about the other Bibles. Help you understand what is different about them. I have three basic, really short, even shorter points about other Bibles. It's that they are corruptible, they are critical, and they are changeable. And I want to give you an example. Maybe this will help connect some dots here. These King James New Testaments were printed this year, just a few months ago. If you don't have one, take one with you. If you want one, they're totally free, just like salvation. I've got seven of them here. And then here I have what's called the Holman Christian Standard Bible. This was printed in 2009. It originated in 1999. Now, what the translators have done is they say, well, we have the majority text, right? Wouldn't you agree we've got a majority over here? We've got 5,210 copies of the Bible, but wait, we've got something that's newer. Or I'm sorry, older, right? I'm not, so this is 10 years old. This is two months old. So this one is older. Therefore, we will use a numbering system and we'll give it the vote of 100. Now this is missing verses. So imagine this. Well, this has a weight of 100 and these seven only e equal up to seven. Therefore, this is more accurate. This is what we will use. This is essentially what they have done with the new translations. They found 45 different copies, and by the way, of the 45 copies in the critical text, or the minority text, they are not complete copies. They are partial copies, partial pages, omissions, deletions, areas that are clearly erased, and of those, most commonly, it was called the Westcott and Hort, which is what was used, and again, Jesuits, a conspiracy to pervert the Bible in the 1880s, well, that is what most of your newer Bibles are based on. But yet, if you open them and, and read them, they will tell you it's the 27th edition of the Nestle Aland, which is the same thing. And what, well, we revise it again. Hey, we revise it. We found another snippet, right? But it's still a minority. And if you gave it a one-to-one -one vote, you would be looking at, at 5,210 versus 45. Well, but some of these 45 are older. Well, I have... Bibles that are older that have not been used. The Bible I use all the time, it is beat up, it's tore up, it's missing pages. I joke, I call one of them my loose leaf edition. I go like this and a page falls on the floor, right? Because it's got some usage, it's got some miles on it. Now, does that make this one not accurate? Not preserved, not dependable, not perfect? No. And that's what the new translators have done. And I tell you, they are corruptible. It is the corruptible seed. The gospel has been changed in every one of these Bibles. The Bible says the words of the Lord are pure words. And these Bibles intentionally attack the Lord Jesus Christ. They attack the Godhead, the Trinity, hell, things that you have to understand. Hey, if you, you, have to, you ever heard the phrase, you have to get somebody lost before you get them saved? If you run into somebody and, oh, I think I'm a pretty good person. What are you trusting in to get to heaven? Why? Well, man, I sure put in my works. I, I go to that confessional booth. Okay, well, that won't get you to heaven. You have to understand that we have earned death and hell because of our sin by breaking God's law. Oh man, that's sobering. I deserve to go to hell. Hey, I'm glad you get that. Now here's the good news. You don't have to go if you don't want to. Right? You have to get them lost first. But if you take hell, of every mention you take hell out, well you got a problem. Makes it real hard. Well, if you disobey God's law, you'll go to Hades. Go to Haiti? It's a, that's tropical, isn't it? That sounds fun. They speak Spanish down there, right? No, 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 Hades, it's different, right? People don't understand. They make it very confusing, and this is intentional. And it is called the critical text. They are intentionally critical. They want to criticize the majority because it's older, because it's not what they want. The Holman Christian Bible, this one right here, in Matthew 8, it says, Right away, a man with a serious skin disease came up and knelt before him. But the King James Bible says, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord... Now, why would you take out the worship of Jesus? Unless you're attacking the deity. 
I worship Jesus. He is my God. He is my Savior. Amen. You know, this is also a, a oneness Bible. They attack the Godhead. In Colossians 2, it says, in this version, it says, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Whereas your King James Bible reads, for in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead, that's the Trinity. Godhead means like Godhood, like neighborhood, like let us make man in our image. That's under attack in these Bibles. It's intentional. It's not accidental. It's not, it's not, well, it's newer. It's easier to understand. It's easier to understand when you completely delete 16 verses. When you attack the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you remove the word hell. Hell's easy. Is there anybody that doesn't understand hell? <laughs> There's no Trinity. 1 John 5, 7. What does this one say? There are three that testify. What does that mean? What does your Bible say? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Amen. I believe in one God. And He has three parts. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. This Bible also preaches a lordship salvation. In, in, in Romans 10, 9 it says, If you confess with your mouth, and then it puts, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Hey, many in that day will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, right? Have we not done many? I went to church, I fed the poor, I said Jesus is Lord. Are you trusting in your heart? Have you, do you really believe he's your Savior? Because that's salvation. It's not about voicing the words of saying Jesus is Lord. There are many people that say it that don't believe it. They don't trust in Jesus for salvation. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. That's the gospel. Look, this and every other Bible is corruptible. It is critical. It is changeable. In this in particular, this Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Holman's the Holman Broadman Publishing Group has known, been known for years as printing all the Freemasonic Bibles for the lodges. And this version in particular, like I said, it originated in 1999 and all the way up to 2009. But guess what happened last year? They decided it's time to relabel it and do yet another version. Now look, patent law would dictate that when you write something, the patent only lasts for so many years. So if you change it again and renew the patent, then it gives you that so many years again. So not only did they change it and corrupt God's word so they can call it their own, they have to change their own words every word. I preached a whole sermon, you guys may remember this, about the ESV, how they brought out what they called the permanent text. Moving forward, we will not change it yet again. And of course, they came under much scrutiny. Okay, we'll change it, we'll change it, right? <laughs> the Holman, I wanna read this statement for you. It says, consistent feedback from readers showed that the unfamiliarity of Yahweh, now, for those that don't know, the Bible says Jah, or Jehovah, Jerusalem. But they went to a corrupted language, and they went and say Yahweh, totally different name, which is very interesting. There are pagan deities with similar names, but they changed the name of God in the Bible. That's not an accident. Well, they did it over 600 times in this Bible. Your King James Bible says the name Jehovah. Seven times. It's perfect. It's easy to understand. Everywhere else it uses the phrase Lord. Those letters did not have the vowel points, so therefore it only used Jehovah where it was necessary to understand the nature of God. Jehovah Jireh, he will provide. Jehovah Nisi, and even just Jah. When I see Jah, I think of like, it's kind of like saying, Father, that's Daddy. You know? That's my dad. You know what I mean? And that's how, I believe God did that for, for perfection. Well, here over 600 times it says, Yahweh, so what did they say about it? Consistent feedback from readers showed that the unfamiliarity of Yahweh was an obstacle to reading the Holman Christian Standard Bible. For example, many have reported that they felt Yahweh was an innovation and they, and that they under, misunderstood the intent behind the formal name of God. A translation that values accuracy and readability was thereby limited to a translation choice that did not provide clarity in the river. Okay, what are they saying? We made it confusing. We're sorry. Don't worry. We'll change it again. 2017, there is officially no more Holman Christian Standard Bible. Yay. Now it's the Christian Standard Bible. This is the reader's choice for all the pulpits in America, which, by the way, is published, patented, and owned by the Southern Baptist Convention. 
who brags about Freemasons in their ranks. They preach a lordship salvation. Listen, society should not decide which Bible is right. The readers don't get to pick what they like in the Bible. That's what God said. Whether you like it or not, it's true. It's His Word. It's His promise. It's His covenant. Yeah. Now deal with it. And look, they change it for patent's sake. And oh, you know, maybe, maybe we should say, instead of he and she, we should say it so we don't offend these gender neutral freaks out there. Look, they're doing that in these Bibles. Strange days we live in. The Word of God is under attack. But the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of fire, furnace of earth purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You can trust your King James Bible. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for just keeping your word real. Thank you for making sure that I have a copy and everyone else has a copy. Lord, if they decide to make the Bible illegal, it won't change the fact that you've spread it all across the world. Lord, they make drugs illegal and everybody has them. If they make your word illegal tomorrow, we will keep preaching it. We will keep passing it out. We will keep printing it. Lord, your words are pure. And we thank you for preserving them for us. Lord, we ask that you would bless our time and fellowship today. And those that go out preaching the gospel, Lord, we trust you to provide the increase. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.